One of the effects of the current COVID lockdown is that I find myself dipping much more into the Old Testament. Some of the bits which have previously seemed remote and slightly odd uh, suddenly make more sense. The emphasis of washing of hands, for example, the almost obsession with it, or telling people who think they have a disease to go and isolate themselves outside the camp for seven days seems a lot more understandable and actually quite familiar at the moment. When we now are faced with the disease that we can't vaccinate against and that we have no drugs that will treat, it seems that we're not so far removed from the Bronze Age as we'd like to think. However, I'm much more struck by the passages which offer hope in the face of overwhelming odds. Some of the Psalms, of course, do that. Psalm 46, for example, was the first verse we looked at in our virtual house group. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. God is our refuge and strength. But for me it's in the prophets that I find people trying to make sense of the kind of times that we're in, and hence our reading from the book of Jeremiah. The action there takes place in Judah, uh, which has already been ransacked once by the Egyptians and once by the Babylonians, and once again the Babylonians are back at the gates. The last time they swept through, they took into captivity most of the people who ran the place, so any civil servants or senior officials, anyone who seemed particularly useful, and so Judah has already been stripped of most of its skillful people. And they've been taken back as captives to Babylon to work for the Babylonians. This exile, which continued for a couple of generations, was one of the defining moments of Jewish history. And that's where we get, for example, Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down, there we wept, for we remembered Zion. But Jeremiah wasn't one of the ones taken into captivity at this point. At the point we pick up the story, he's literally in lockdown, he's in prison. He's been put there by his own people because he's prophesied the very defeat that they are seeing and staring straight in the face, which has never been popular. So he's living in a defeated country, being led by a puppet king, with siege ramps already built against the walls of Jerusalem, all the surrounding countryside in enemy hands, the leaders, the civil servants, the officials already in captivity. Jeremiah himself has already been rejected by the Babylonians as not being useful enough to capture, and so unpopular his own people that he's been thrown into jail. Jeremiah sits waiting for the axe to fall on his country as he knows it will and as he's prophesied that it will. It's a bleak picture. But it's against that background and at that point that God asks him to bring a message of hope to the people. As they wait for the end to fall, his cousin Hanamel comes and asks him to buy a field. Now, this is a field that is either already in enemy hands or is just about to be. And either way, it's a very bit of sh a bit of very sharp practice to try and sell it. But Jeremiah, sensing that God wants to send a message through him, buys the land. It makes no sense. Jeremiah is in prison, and in any case, it's being invaded by the Babylonians. But he goes to great pains to weigh the money to make sure it's witnessed, to, and make sure the deeds are recorded and signed, and sealed in clay jars, which will last for hundreds of years. Why does he do this? Well, he explains. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. This is Jeremiah's prophecy. This is not the end. There is a future. And his prophecy was powerful for two reasons. One, it's an action. And actions speak louder than words. And secondly, he puts his own money where his mouth is. So the sense from Jeremiah is this, that in spite of the world seeming to come to an end, and Jerusalem was destroyed. In spite of that, there was still hope, there was still purpose, and there was still a future. It was to be two generations before the start of the return from exile. Jeremiah did not live to see it, but what he prophesied did come through. Jerusalem did rise again and thrive again. So what can we take from this incident, and why, why have I read it this morning? Well, three things struck me as I do it. First of all, Jeremiah was prepared to give an unpopular message when others were not. He described it like this. He said, From the greatest to the least, all are greedy for gain. 
prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wounds of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. None of us wants this pandemic, none of us. We all want the restrictions to be over, we all want to go back to normal. But we don't need anyone telling us peace when there is no peace. A friend of mine, meaning to encourage, sent me a link to a Christian leader a couple of months ago. He said clearly that it would all be over by the 15th of April and all would be fine. Yeah, right. We don't need that kind of nonsense. We never have. Ezekiel, preaching around the same time as Jeremiah, also railed against the prophets. They say peace, but there isn't any peace. They're like people who build a weak wall and then try to cover up the weakness by painting it. That sound familiar? So we need to be careful about what we listen to and what we pass on. There is no shortage of false prophets and what we need is realistic, sober judgment. Secondly, I think that Jeremiah knew that his prophecy was not really for him, but for others. He could see the signs of destruction round about him and he wasn't a stupid man hence preserving the contracts and sealed jars that would last for generations. If you're anything like me, you'll be focused on the immediate future. When will I be allowed out to meet family and friends? When will I be back at the shops or have a holiday? When will we be back at Holy Trinity, worshipping together? Or perhaps much deeper worries about health or about finance at the moment. But our faith communities exist not over weeks or months, or even years, they exist over generations and over centuries. We are part of a great sweep of history. It's a dramatic and profoundly difficult time for many of us at the moment, and I don't want to underestimate the profound challenges that we face, but we're part of something longer and bigger, and that's a perspective that Jeremiah brought. Our great cathedrals always remind me of this when I go into them. They've seen it all, they've seen plagues and wars and disasters, and still they stand. They're a reminder that we're part of something that was here long before us and will be here long after we're gone. We are part of a chain stretching back for generations into the past and stretching for generations into the future. And we've not been great at acting that out. In the secular world, we have been consuming the resources of our planet faster than it can possibly replenish or cope, effectively writing checks that our children and grandchildren will have to pay. We have invested in the here and now to give us a comfortable life, not in the future to pass it on to future generations. In the church, we've been guilty of doing the same, making it comfortable for us at the moment, but at the expense of the next generations. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, said, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. Perhaps we could also apply the same test to our church. And that's the challenge to us. Jeremiah left a field and left hope. All for the future, not for him. And as we emerge from this shadow cast by this dreadful disease, the questions for us are not just when we can get back to normal, but what sort of normal we want to get back to. What will we leave for those who come after us, both in the way we live our lives and in the way we live out our faith and the way we do church. I visited Japan a couple of years ago and one of my hosts who I was visiting wore a face mask the whole time I was there. Now you'll know that mask wearing is much more of a thing over there than it is here. But I realised when I was there that I, I didn't really understand why. I knew him well enough to ask him, was he worried about pollution or was he worried about catching a disease from someone else? Neither, he said. He had a cold and he didn't want to pass it on to anyone else. It was a courtesy to wear a mask. Now, whatever you think of face masks, it does mark out a thinking which is 180 degrees away from the thinking in our society. We're concerned about whether a mask protects us. He was concerned, and actually that whole society is concerned about whether it protects others. Interesting. Jeremiah bought a field not for his own profit, not for his own benefit, but as a sign of hope for others, for those who were already in the exile and those who were to follow and afterwards. We have to think both in a wider context in terms of history and also in a wider context in terms of society. It's not all about me. Finally, I'm struck by what Jeremiah did in a hopeless position. He has to give a message of hope to the people, but how? He's been rejected and nobody seems to listen much to what he says, and the ones that do throw him into prison. So what can Jeremiah do to bring this message of hope? There's no crowd, there's no platform. No popularity, no freedom even. 
so he uses what he can. He buys a field as a clear statement of his faith and his investment in the future. We are, as individuals and as a church, at a time when we face the same kind of issue. How can we bring a message of hope when we're locked down, unable to meet, many of us unable even to leave the house? And yet there are things we can do. These video services, unthinkable two months ago, have reached more people than we ever have on a Sunday morning. People have been looking out for each other, phoning, caring, looking after. And we'll remember the kind phone call, the offers of help, the things people have done. We'll remember these things long after we've forgotten every sermon. What can we do? Arthur Ashe, the great tennis player, said in a great quote that sums it up, Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And that's what we're all called to do. That's our challenge as individuals as in a church. It'll be different for all of us, but encouragement isn't expensive and kindness isn't being rationed. So let's use what we have as an opportunity to go and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Dear Father, as we enter into your presence, quieten our hearts. Recenter our scattered, sometimes chaotic thoughts. Help us to listen for your still, small voice. Even when chaos surrounds us, let us listen and believe your words. Be still and know that I am God. We pray today for your church across the world, and especially for our church here at Holy Trinity in Ear. Let us feel drawn close to one another by the Holy Spirit, despite being separated at the moment. Thank you for Martin, our Rector. Help him to feel guided and supported by you at this time. Help us all in these strange times to know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we thank you for all who have given their lives to protect us. We pray for all affected by the consequences of war. Bring peace to our broken world. We pray for our world, especially during this pandemic. We pray for the hundreds of thousands of people affected by COVID-19 across the world. Be especially close to those in hospital and intensive care units. Help every doctor, nurse and support worker caring for these patients. Give them skill, compassion and empathy, even when they themselves are frightened and exhausted. We pray for everyone living with fear and uncertainty, whether because of the virus or its financial impact on the world. Raise up leaders and politicians of integrity and faith, Father, to help guide us through these times. Help us to become more caring people because of this experience, Lord, thinking more of others and less of ourselves. We pray for a special blessing on everyone in the community helping neighbours, the elderly and sick who are housebound, supermarket workers, lorry drivers, bin men. Thank you for servant-hearted people. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all suffering physical or mental anguish just now, Father, for all going through difficult treatments, for those who are ill or caring for loved ones. We pray for all who are jobless or fearful for the future, for the lonely, the excluded, the homeless, for all struggling with grief or the frailty of old age. Be a refuge and strength for us all, dear God. We take a few moments to pray silently for all we know and love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, leave us with your peace. Let us echo the psalmist in Psalm 131. I have stilled and quietened my soul, like a weaned child with its mother. 
like a weaned child is my soul within me. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.